927. Don't know how far we'll get through today, but we'll hopefully get through a bit. Um, and I think I'm going to, I'm not going to go over every term, but I'm going to tell you the terms, just, you know, circle them in your book or whatever, that are going to be important. So on 927, just all of them. All those bold face terms. End rhyme, internal rhyme, masculine rhyme, feminine rhyme, exact rhymes, and then near rhyme, also called off rhyme, slant rhyme, approximate rhyme. Know those, right? You had one or two of those in the extra credit on the quiz today. Um, top of 928, consonants, okay? Identical consonant sound preceded by different vowel sound, know that one. So let's look at the poem on 929. Since what has preceded this is all about rhyme, just listen to the rhyme in this poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins, Jesuit priest, um, God's grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. Okay? There's a break there. Normally, when there's a break in poetry, um, other than between stanzas, you have a break like between the first half of a line and the second half of a line. We'll talk, it's going to come up in a moment. It's called a seshura. This isn't a seshura, but it's a, it's a break in kind of flow and idea. You get a bit of a change in these last six lines. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs. Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah bright wings. So notice what Hopkins is doing there in those two stanzas. The first one, he starts off, the world is charged with the grandeur of God, like the glory of God. Okay, and says it will flame out like shining from shook foil. Think of a thing of tin foil, and you go out in the sun and shake it. You get all the sparkles from it. He says the glory of God will do the same thing from the world. That is, it can't be hidden, even though, beginning with line five, humanity has done what? Humanity generations have trod, trod, trod. All is seared with trade. Bleared, smeared. What's the all? The world. The world becomes reduced to what? What can be bought and sold. Okay. So he's saying, he's implying, the world that, quote unquote, at its creation, you know, beautiful, full of glory and all that, and what has humanity done? Has simply turned it into something to be traded, to be bought and sold. And because of that, because it is bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell, the soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. The soil is bare now implies the soil can't produce. The soil is dead. And the foot can't feel it. Why? Because the foot is shod. He's implying we, collectively, he's writing this in 1877, we, in our 1877 mentality have removed ourselves from nature. Well, think how much more removed from nature we are in 2018 than they were in 1877. <coughs> and then you get that little bit of shift that I indicated. And for all this, nature is never spent. For all this means in spite of all this. Nature's never spent, meaning nature's never done. Nature's never wiped out. Why? There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And I think all he means by that is all you have to do to quote unquote see that glory is to maybe dig down a little bit or 
open your eyes and look out that window at that tree. And it'll kind of shake you out of your complacency. And though the last lights off the Black West went, that is, and it's pitch dark, what happens? The very next morning, the sun rises. And the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast. That is, and renews everything again. Okay, turn from there, page 931. Jabberwocky. Have any of you read this before? High school or something? What kind of poem is this? Notice who it's written by. Lewis Carroll. Alice in Wonderland. Alice through the looking glass. Okay? This is an example of what's called a nonsense poem. Why? Because it literally doesn't make any sense. Why does it not make any sense? Well, because some of the words are total nonsense words. That is, they are words he made up that have no real meaning in this world. Others of the words do have meanings in this world. In this, yeah, in this world. Okay? What else? Even the words that are nonsense words, we can tell what part of speech they are. We can tell that there are nouns and there are verbs and there are adjectives. Why? Because they behave like nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Twas brillig in the slithy toes. What does slithy mean? What's it sound like? It's an example of what's called a portmanteau. I often do this accidentally when I'm teaching. It's budding together parts of two words. Okay? So, slithy. What could that be from? Sly and trustworthy? Could come from that. What else could it come from? Slither like a snake. Slither like a snake? What else could it be from? Take the slee and then the y at the end. Just remove what's in the middle. Slippery? Okay, then what about the v? Word like smithy, that's the place where the smith works. Okay. There are other words that end with THY, three hours sleep, I can't think of them. So, twas brillig in the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave, or gyre and gimble. I have no idea how those two are supposed to be pronounced. According to Carol, to gyre and gimble in the wave, or gyre and gimble in the wave. Gyre is a real world, a real word in this world. It's something that rotates and turns. Okay. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the moan rats outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son. Now that makes perfect good sense. Perfectly good sense. Wow, it's going to be one of those days. Okay. Beware. Danger, you know. Jabberwock, not quite sure what that is. My son's clear. The jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Now that totally makes sense. And then you get, beware of the jub jub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. Jub jub. Frumious. No idea. He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time the manxome foe he sought, so rested he by the tum, tum tree and stood a while in thought. So, what's the story we've been told so far? Somebody's out hunting something. How do we know? He took his vorpal sword with him. And the father told the someone out hunting, beware the jabberwock. And as in oofish thought he stood. Oofish. Kind of like oafish, right? He stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the told you wood and burbled as it came. Burbled, like bubbled and gurgled, put together. 
One, two, one, two, went through and through. The vorpal blade went, blade went snickersnack. <clears throat> he left it dead, and with its head, he went galumping back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O Freb, just a kalu kale. He chortled in his joy. Twas brillig in the slithy toes that gyre and jimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves and the mome rats outgrave. Something happened, but we're not sure what. So what's the purpose of it? I mean, he wrote this for a reason. Nobody writes something without a reason for writing. You just got to use your imagination. Use your imagination? Child entertainment? Kids, little kids love this. They love the sounds of it. That's why it's written. The sounds of it. Right? Look at all the rhyme and the sounds within. All right? Wood, stood, snack, back, kalu, kale, etc. Keep going to go on to principles of rhythm on page 29. Excuse me, chapter 29, pages 946 and following. So again, as before, I'll point out the terms, look at them later. Rhythm, stress, it's a pattern of stress and unstressed syllables, okay? Str the word stress and accent on 947, you need to know. Meter and prosody and scansion on 948. And foot on 948. On 949, iambic pentameter, blank verse, those are only two on that page. Okay? Iambic pentameter, blank verse. 950, masculine ending, fending, uh, fending, imminent. There's an example of a portmanteau. Feminine ending, sechura, and then the three at the bottom. In stop line, run on line, and in gemment. If you've noticed, sometimes when I've been reading, you know, several of these poems, I don't stop at the end of the line. Why? Because there's no mark of punctuation. The mark of punctuation indicates a pause. And if there's not one, usually what that means is you go on until there is an end. So I'll look at the one by William Wordsworth, bottom of 950. My heart leaps up. Wordsworth, by the way, was a romantic poet. That doesn't mean he wrote about love. It means he wrote about nature. Right? The romantics were individuals who, you know, had kind of some of their core beliefs. One, we need to throw off the shackles of society and <laughs> civilization, and we need to get in touch with ourselves, and we need to get in touch with the world. And the way you do that is by going out and being in nature. To some extent, that's what they believed. So, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Pause. Long pause. Because it's a colon. So was it when my life began? So is it now I am a man? So be it when I shall grow old. Or let me die. The child is father of the man. And I could wish my days to be about each to each by natural piety. So, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Notice the rhythm. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began, so is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old, that changes the rhythm. Or let me die. Or let me die, all four of those Syllables are stressed. All right. So what's he saying? What's the poem mean? When I see a rainbow, what happens? What happens when we have, you know, when there's a wildfires in the west, big volcanic eruption in the west, what do we get often in the east? Especially at sunset. Beautiful red sunsets. Why? Because all the dust in the air. 
right? The kind of sense that, that make people go outside and go, wow, that's what he means. It's that oh, moment. I don't know if you've ever seen, you know, a comet. Not the stupid little ones that you gotta get out mag, you know, binoculars or telescopes, but a comet with your bare naked eye. It's that kind of thing. Or the total solar solar eclipse last year. Or was it this year? Okay. It makes you kind of go, whoa. That's what he's talking about. That's the experience. So was it when my life began? That is, when I was a child. Children can have what better than us older people? Imagination, what else? Louder? Vision? What do you mean by vision? You mean this kind of vision? Creativity. Sometimes, creativity. Let me rephrase that. They're not as filled with what as we are. Okay, take it back. I won't say you guys are. As I am, I'm nearly 57. What, hap what tends to happen as you grow older? Not saying it should, it tends to. You get a little bit more jaded in life. That is, it takes an awful lot more to make you go, whoa, cool. Because life tends to suck. <laughs> okay? He's saying, so was it when my life began, so is it now I am a man. I can still look, he says, at a rainbow house as a child. And then I'd go, oh, look at the reflection of the water droplets, you know, bending the light. <laughs> What's the difference between a scientist's appreciation for a rainbow and a little kid's? Can a little kid explain it? No. no. Just thinks it's totally cool. So, so <laughs> be it when I shall grow old or let me die. When? Notice the or let me die implies what? Not when I'm old. Now, let me die what? Before I can no longer look at that rainbow with eyes of wonder. The child is father of the man. Doesn't that turn things around? What is that, by the way? Term that was on the quiz. It's an oxymoron. Doesn't sound correct. How's it an oxymoron? Because men beget children. Child don't beget. So how is it true? An oxymoron is something that appears contradictory, but on closer examination, you realize it's true. What happens to every male child? Grows up, as long as you know, nothing hinders it, grows up to be a man. That's how the child is father to the man. And I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. Natural piety. That's looking at the natural world. Okay. Um, let's go on to poetic forms. Chapter 30, pages 9, 70, and 71. Um... So the terms on 970 and 71, know those. Fixed form, free verse, open form, stanza, rhyme scheme. Okay. On 972 and 73, um, just do all the terms on 970, or know all the terms on 972. On 973, quatrain. In the various forms of sonnet, we're going to do several sonnets. Actually, let me talk about those. So, sonnets come from a Italian, an Italian writer named uh, Francis Petrarch, or Franciscus Petrarch, right, who wrote these poems about a woman that he fell in love with. In sonnet... Um, just essentially means little love poem, okay? <coughs> so in an Italian sonnet, or Petrarchan sonnet, if you want, you have 14, every sonnet has 14 lines, has to have 14 lines. In an Italian or Petrarchan sonnet, 
Those 14 lines are divided into the octave, the first eight lines, and the sestet, the last six lines. And notice you have a rhyme scheme there for the octave and the sestet. And at the end of the eighth line, beginning of the ninth line, you often get what's called the volta. Volta means turn. That is, there's a shift in attitude between the first eight lines and the last six lines. All right? And then we're going to talk about the English sonnet in a moment, or Shakespearean sonnet. So you have two kind of Italian sonnets, even though they're written by Englishmen, on pages 974 and 975. Look at the one by William Wordsworth on 975. The world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are up, up, and are up gathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. And then notice he has a period and a dash. Hard stop, turn. The turn is there. In the middle of that line is where the volta occurs. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. Now, this poem is similar to his previous one that we looked at, My Heart Leaps Up, and it's also a little bit similar to God's grandeur. The world is too much with us, meaning what? Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers, little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away a sordid boon. How have we given our hearts away? How is the world too much with us? He's not talking about the natural world. He's talking about our experience of society, civilized world. Right? We, lay, we lay waste our powers doing what? That means we work. We give away our lives. Getting and spending. That is, getting and getting rid of. So he moves from that and talks about an ocean. He's standing at the edge of an ocean on a lee, he says, which is like a promontory and, and almost a peninsula, looking out at the water. And says, the sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling out all hours, are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. Meaning, we don't hear it. We don't see what the world is saying to us. It moves us not. That is, it doesn't produce anything. It's like someone who has grown up their entire lives in a big city and never seen mountains. Someone, for example, who lives all their life in Chicago or Houston or New York or Detroit and has never been outside the city to see mountains. Or someone who has you know, grown up in Tennessee and never been to the beach and seen an ocean. Right? He said, that ought to move you. I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. Creed outworn, that is a belief system that is dead. A pagan, like a follower of Zeus, or Apollo, or Athena. I'd rather be one of those. Why? Because if I were standing here, I might have what? Glimpses that would make me less forlorn. Glimpses of what? Of those old beliefs. Why? Because our modern, he's implying, the modern beliefs, the modern way of looking at the world, of seeing those beautiful yellowish-orange leaves out there and saying, 
Well, that's just because you know photosynthesis is not working as well as it should be because there's less nutrient arriving in the leaves and the tree is getting ready to shed the leaves rather than going, my God, look at those colors. Okay? English sonnet, bottom of 975, or Shakespearean sonnet. Okay? It's not octave and sestet. It's three quatrains. Quatrain is a four-line stanza. And a final couplet. The final couplet is usually a summation, a conclusion, okay? a therefore kind of a response. All right? So you have on the next page probably one of the, I don't know, three or four most famous of Shakespeare's 154 sonnets. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? This is written about a man, by the way. It's not written about a woman. It's not written to a woman. It's written to a man. It's written to a young man who, from what we're told early in the sonnets, this is sonnet 18, there's 154 of them, um, is a young man who is an aristocrat, and who has long, curly, blonde hair, okay? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darting buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Now, in Shakespeare's day, temperate and date rhyme, okay? Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is its gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So, before we do the final couplet, or the, yeah, the final couplet, What's the speaker saying in these four, in these three quatrains? Ask a question. Should I compare you to a summer's day? And then immediately says, hmm, I don't know. Let's think about this for a moment. You're more lovely and more temperate. Right? Because summer can be really hot. That is, <laughs> temperate means what? Moderate. Summer can get really hot. I remember, you know, 2012, I built a uh, what, 900 square foot deck off my back of the house. And like the damn fool that I am, I did that when we had two straight weeks of triple digit temperatures. It was over 110 every day. Okay? And I was out there every day, you know, hammering screw gun and everything. So, no, you are more lovely and more temperate than what? Than a summer's day. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. May isn't summer, but what happens in May? You have storms. They have storms in England in May, just like we do. Okay? And summer's lease hath all too short a date. And in England at least, summer can end early. Okay? You can actually get snow. In fact, I um saw uh, a clip of Newcastle in northern England, Newcastle on Tyne in northern England, first week of October, they were having heavy snow. That, even though that's early fall, that's ridiculous, okay? And I've been in London in summers, many summers I've been in London, when the temperature's been 65 at the highest, okay? So, Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, it gets really hot. Often is his gold complexion dim, it's overclass and cloudy, and every fair from fair sometime declines. Every fair from fair, every beautiful thing declines from its beauty. Right? Take a flower. It blooms, it's beautiful, and what happens a few days later? Carpe diem. It's dead. 
How does it decline? By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. We're coming up to a holiday when people are going to talk about Thanksgiving dinner with all the trimmings. What are all the trimmings? Everything else but the turkey. Okay? So why are those called trimmings? It means adornments. Coming up to another holiday after that. I know there are marketers kind of get these a bit confused because Christmas. And what do people do, quote unquote, with their Christmas trees? They trim them. Doesn't mean they go out with pruning shears and make them so that they're a perfect triangle. No, it means they decorate, they ornament them. Okay? So, by nature's changing course, untrim. So, if trimming something is to decorate or ornament it, untrimming is to unornament. Well, how are we, you more than me, ornamented? Think of that poem that talked about the woman's skin as clear and smooth and supple when she was young. And then have the woman sit out in the sun, I don't know, 80 days a year for another 20 years. And what's your skin look like? Old and tan and leathery. Okay? That's the untrimming. It's the removing the beauty. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. That is, you, the person being addressed, your eternal summer, because summer is when all plants are what? They're at their greatest show. You, your eternal summer, won't fade. Nor will it lose possession of that fair, that beauty, that you own. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. When in eternal lives to time thou growest. Notice the pun. When in eternal lines to time thou growest. What happens to your face as you get older? You develop wrinkles. Those are the eternal lines. Possibly. That's how Shakespeare's punning. Because what are the real eternal lines that to time the individual being described has grown? lines of the palm. Why are they eternal? So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see. Notice the rhythm there. So long lives this. Pause. And this gives life to thee. What's the this? My palm. But the palm only works how? Or when? As long as there are men around, people, not just men, and they're not all blind. So if this thing were to magically be dropped on an island of all blind people that weren't in Braille, what? The person being described would be dead and would wander in time's shade. All right? Look at the next one. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Sting, by the way, ripped off the title for the title of the song that he did back in the late 80s, early 90s. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. What time is it? Nine fifteen. Coral is far more red than her lips red. Now I'm to mention here. What Shakespeare is doing here is he's taking this idea of a blazon, which is a catalog of beauty, okay? And he's flipping it on its head. He's reversing it. It's an anti-blazon. This is something that Petrarch did. So, um, Marvell's to his coy mistress. Remember the blazon there? A hundred years for her eyes and forehead he would praise, had we world enough in time. Two hundred for each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest. 
He's cataloging her, her, her beauties according to his frame of uh, mind or his perspective. So Shakespeare's kind of doing the same thing with this poem. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. In typical Petrarchan fashion, you would compare your beloved's eyes to the sun. Dazzling. Okay? But no, this one's orange. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. Done is kind of the color of this shirt. Dirty dishwater. Or dirty laundry water. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damaged red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And it, my favorite couplet in all of Shakespeare. And in some perfumes is there a more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love those two lines. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. <coughs> and yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she be lied with false compare. So what's he doing here? And I had, a, I had a point out. This is sonnet 131. In Shakespeare's sonnets, 1 through 126 are pretty much either to or about what's called the golden-haired youth. Okay. 127 through 152 are about the dark lady. And 153 and 54 are just kind of added on. They're not about either of these two. Right? The dark lady does come into these sonnets because the golden haired youth becomes friends with her, has sex with her. Right? Um, He's written not really, he's referred to a little bit in these. Right? So, her eyes are nothing like the sun. If they're nothing like the sun, that means the opposite to the sun. The sun is bright and white if you look at it long enough. So her eyes are what? Dark. They're black. Coral. I know we're almost out of time. We'll have to come back to this on Wednesday. What would Shakespeare's experience of coral have been? Where does coral grow? Okay, in the ocean. Does it grow in the North Atlantic? Tropics. What happens when you take coral out of the ocean? It dies. And louder? It bleaches. So if coral is far more red than her lips are red, in coral, as Shakespeare would have experienced, it would have been kind of pale. What's he saying about her lips? <laughs> You're kind of disgusting. Yeah. Okay, we'll pick up there.